Morning, David. Um, where do you stand on all this? Obviously, we've seen these terrible scenes coming out of roads of Corfu, people being evacuated. The Green Lobby, very keen to jump on onto this and to say, actually, this is all due to climate change. Even though we now know the fires in Corfu were started by arsonists, it looks increasingly likely that they were also started in roads. We know the ground is tinder dry. We know that, that actually there is some, there is climate change, no doubt, happening. The question is, how much of this is man-made? Also, this quest for net zero in this country, if we only emit one percent of world emissions why are we pursuing this doggedly well i think that's the question that many uh, electors many people in the country will be asking over the years to come as we're asked to you know, give up our uh, very reliable very uh, either things we understand the internal combustion engine car into electric vehicles when we're asked to strip out our perfectly functioning uh, gas boilers and have uh, very expensive heat pumps that don't do the job very well uh, and much more besides when you look around the world, you've got China going gangbusters for, for new coal, uh, new coal power stations, uh, Indonesia, India, all the other growing countries will also be looking for cheap energy to get economic growth because they go hand in hand. So as that continues, people in the country will say, well, why us? As you quite rightly say, we're responsible for 1% of uh, global CO2. If the UK were to be wiped off the planet, it would be barely a rounding error. But of course, the uh, the fires in Rhodes and other parts of Greece are very lurid. They're, you know, the, the, you've got the flames lapping around uh, tourists. Uh, you know, this is grist to the mill of all of those who are rather more adherent on the, the climate change hysteria, of which I'm not one of them. Uh, but, uh, yes, it, it, it adds to all that. Now, you say about the the scientists modelling that none of this would happen without human-induced uh, CO2 and climate change. Well, if their models are so good, uh, might I recommend that they perhaps uh, offer their uh, scientific model into the OBR and the Bank of England because they don't seem to be able to get <laughs> forecasts right for more than a year ahead. But, uh, you know, these climate change models seem so accurate they can see way out to 50 years in the future and know within a, a, a fraction of a degree what the temperature will be. Well, bully for them. They must have something up their sleeve that nobody else has discovered. It's a, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Well, I mean, this is the point. I was talking to Natalie Bennett earlier in the week, and she said, oh, it's all settled science. Everyone agrees that this is man-made global warming. Now, actually, that is not true. And I've been looking back. You know, you've got people like the Global Climate Intelligence Group. This is 1,500 scientists and professionals. They say actually natural as well as anthropogenic factors cause the warming. The warming is slower than predicted, that the IPCC is wrong. The inadequate modelling done by the IPCC also talks about that actually global warming hasn't increased natural disasters. You've also got another group of scientists also challenging net zero with science. This is a paper written by emeritus professors just saying basically the IPCC is wrong, the modelling is wrong, and yet we, the consumer, are being told what to do, what we can buy, and also our electricity is going up, and we are in the middle of this. Well, no, you're absolutely right. What, what we're embarked upon, just for the UK alone, is potentially a two trillion pound exercise uh, uh, to decarbonise and to electrify the system. I mean, that's a very, well, it's, it's not just a small amount of money, it is a vast amount of money. It, it's, it, it's virtually the GDP of a nation we've got to spend on this exercise. Now, if I'm being asked to do that with absolutely good reason, then perhaps mm. I might go along with it. But until that science is completely settled, until we're completely sure that those climate change models are entirely accurate, then I have some concerns. I mean, what we're seeing in Greece, I mean, there have been forest fires forevermore. Um, the European Forest Fire Information System only discovered that existed yesterday to do the analysis across Europe of these type of wildfires. And it's, more, it's just an average year. This happens on a regular basis. It's an average year. And uh, it's probably more down to arson. I mean, you can't do much about arson, whether there's climate change or not. If people are mad enough to set fires in mm. tinder dry condition, the, the they should um, find the extent of the law uh, rather than just everybody jump on these lurid pictures and say, oh, this is proof of climate change. Say there is climate change. Say all these models are absolutely correct. And, and if we're embarked upon this exercise, I certainly hope they are. Uh, we might be better off spending a mere fraction of that money actually adapting to change because there is no way that China's going to stop. 
that Indonesia as it grows is going to stop and nor is India going to stop and many other countries. So what Britain is doing seems uh, remarkably and peculiarly stupid when the rest of the world is really not catching up. You know, we've said for years, oh, well, we will be the, you know, the f first in the field for new technologies. There'll be a great new market there uh, and people will come with us. Well, just look at the what China has done. We've been nice to China for years, hoping that they would join the uh, the normality of developed nations. It hasn't worked. They do their own thing, uh, and this is where we are. So, uh, yeah, it's a good week for climate change activists because they've got all the lovely pictures. Uh, but this is, in my view, a natural cycle. And you have to ask yourself one, this one question. If it were five degrees cooler in Rhodes and Corfu, which might be the more norm that we see. I mean, we've got this strange jet stream going on, we've got an El Nino year, lots of other things happening as well. Would these fires still have been created? I expect the arsonists would still be putting matches to them, and I don't think that it would have been very much difference. But of course, we've got to have this debate. We're talking about a two trillion mm. pound exercise. Globally, that would be a lot more. That's a lot of capital being used which could be used on something perhaps more productive and certainly on adaptation, which might be the cheaper route. I mean, it's really interesting, actually, to see the way the government is also sort of, well, certainly discussing the implementation of these things like banning new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. I think the Uxbridge by-election has completely shocked uh, the government because obviously they realise that actually most people in this country don't, they like the theory of net zero, they just don't like the impact and the way that they're being treated. But just in terms of, of, of what you do, the chair of uh, the net zero scrutiny group do they listen to you i think we've moved the dial in some respects i most certainly do we've been working on uh yeah, it's a bit of a peculiar uh aspect that most people wouldn't really even know existed the emissions trading scheme uh, we've uniquely saddled this country with a higher cost per ton of co2 emitted by our high energy industries uh, than anywhere else in the world. So everything we produce is going to be that much more expensive, which uh, is perversely just pushing that high energy use uh, manufacture abroad. So we then import it and we call it net zero. We, you know, it doesn't add to our CO2 figures. So when the government says very uh, loudly that we've reduced our CO2 uh, emission in, in the country, and they say that with great fanfare and great pride, it doesn't, um, it doesn't add into what CO2 is being made on our behalf abroad by all those things that used to be made in the UK and are now being shipped in from other parts of, of the world. So we're, we're into a lot of sort of flawed numbers, flawed statistics, and we're trying to get, cut through that with the Net Zero Scrutiny Group. But also, we're, we're very much focusing on the 2030 car ban at the moment. Mm. You know, why is it that this country alone is talking about banning you know the normal petrol and diesel by 2030 where europe is 2035 the us is 2035 it seems we're again saddling ourselves with something uh, that's rather daft and I, I think the roots of all this was our having cop 26 a few years ago and you know that boris boosterism who who mm -hmm. made something you know even worse if, from from my point of view what we're trying to do is get some common sense into the argument i would rather we were embarked upon a domestic gas policy as we then roll out um, nuclear into the future because domestic gas is a lot cheaper in CO2 terms than importing it on LNG ships from as far away as Australia, which we did last August, and are you know perpetually doing it from Qatar. Mm. That That's the sort of future I'd like to see. We would actually be reducing global CO2 through that sort of policy, which at the end of the day is what I thought this was all about. You know, I'm fully in favour of circular economies, you know, making sure we don't waste things. I mean, we, we do that domestically in our own homes as much as we can, uh, and I think the nation would be well served as well. I worry about unnecessary food miles, all those things that we can do without really affecting our lives, rather than embarking on a two trillion pounds exercise uh, based on some um, spreadsheets and, and, and mm. technology that, people really don't quite they're not quite sure of it i think that's um, right so, and i think yeah, well i think i think i think people at home also want cheap energy they want energy security if the war in ukraine hasn't taught us anything is that we need energy security in this country and actually what it needs is grown-up decision making we need to build nuclear power stations we should have done that years ago of course nick clegg famously said well there's no point because they wouldn't be ready until uh, now um and we wouldn't be quite in this mess that we are now in but thank you very much uh, some sense there but can i ask you very quickly before you go
Um, obviously, the government has uh, made a, a lot of sort of uh, capital over the fact the illegal migration bill has gone through. This is going to be a huge electoral issue going forward as well. Just the scale of the migration problem. There's a story this morning, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, that lawyers are charging £10,000 to make fake asylum claims. So essentially, they are doing this for illegal immigrants. And uh, this is an undercover investigation done by the Mail, where one lawyer asked for £10,000 to invent a horrific backstory to use in the asylum application. Claims of sexual torture, beating, slave labour, forced imprisonment and death threats. They also said, this law legal firm said they could get a doctor's note to back up the story. This is wholesale fraud. Yeah, I did see that story, and I'll, I'll take it as read and the truth about the you know the undercover operation and what they extracted. But I, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. I've been saying something like this for some years. Uh, that we've, we've got lawfare going on. We've got legal aided lawyers who will say, ah. Yeah, look at um, the face of it. You haven't really got a claim here, but make up this story, tick these boxes, use the loopholes that have existed within existing legislation, not least the Modern Slavery Act, put into place for good reason, uh, but exploited for the loopholes that it obviously has. Mm. Tick these boxes, and the likelihood is you will get a yes at the end of uh, of the answer of going through the migration system. Yeah, I'm not surprised to hear it. It's an absolute disgrace. Uh, just as we. You know, we've got enough problems that it is in terms of illegal migration flows across the channel. Where we're going to put these people? We've got local issues of the barges, all of that going on, and then we have what are qualified legal people actually adding and fueling this system. Uh, I'm afraid this is just another outrage to uh, put the cherry on the top of what we know is a, a, a dreadful situation that has to be stopped. Let's hope this illegal migration bill will work. Uh, let's hope that the uh, Supreme Court does allow the Rwanda policy, which might take some of the pull factors away. But do you know what would work within a fortnight? Would be, please, France. We've given you half a billion pounds to actually stop these launchings from the beaches. If they were to stop that, it's only talking about plus or minus three miles from Calais, then I think this trade could stop within a fortnight. But um, uh, perhaps that is living in fantasy land.